Okay, welcome everybody to week five of Wildlife and Water Friendly Gardens. Um, I'll keep my uh, comments brief. And I am Michelle Scholes, and I'm an instructor here at Clackamas Community College's Environmental Learning Center and, and coordinator of this, this program um, that we are now into year four of. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, and I'd like to thank our sponsor, who is Clackamas Water Environment Services, for the financial support they provide so we can all watch these wonderful presenters for free. Um, also, as you can see on our slide, uh, our other sponsors are Clackamas River Basin Council, Clackamas River Water Providers, the Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District, Greater Oregon City Watersheds Council, um, and North Clackamas also Watersheds Council and uh, Oak Lodge Water Services, last but not least. And we will be very pleased to hear from uh, a representative from them today, Lara, who, who will be joining us, uh, who will be opening our presentations today. All right, with that, I'd like to turn over to Alexis, who will introduce our speakers. Thanks. Thanks, and hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, a couple of Zoom housekeeping things that you've probably heard me say already if you've been tuning in the last several weeks um, is good job for having microphones on mute. Let's, for the most part, keep them that way. Um, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, so please send them in via chat um, during the presentations. In the past, we've gone a little bit over and gone until maybe 1.15ish for folks, but we are going to need to wrap basically right at 1 o'clock or maybe 5 past today. So um, I will be uh, consolidating those questions and, and relaying them to Lara and Lydia at the end. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. We have Lara Christensen. So Lara brings a background in nonprofit and government organizations with over 20 years in positions focused on creating cultural change through public policy, experiential science education, outreach, public relations, program implementation, and regulatory oversight. The bulk of her experience lies in project management, program development, and as a grant program officer. In addition, Lara has spent hours in the field sampling water, monitoring macroinvertebrates, and working with students. She holds a master's in environmental sciences slash studies from the or University of Oregon with a focus on sustainable systems and a bachelor's from Pomona College with a focus on literature, philosophy, and dance. Lydia Cox is the lead landscape designer and owner of Radish Gardens. She helps clients dream up spaces where they can grow food, create backyard habitat, and connect with nature at home. Born and raised in Oregon, Lydia holds a bachelor's degree in design and an associate's degree in environmental landscape management. Lydia teaches classes on creating an edible landscape for the local soil and water conservation district and offers educational webinars on selecting native plants for your landscape, managing insects in the organic garden, and more. Um, Lydia was just giving some workshops earlier this week, so we are lucky to have her during this really busy week. Um, with no further ado, um, I will turn it over to Lara for our watershed introduction and then Lydia from there. All right, thank you. Welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be here today representing Oak Lodge Water Services. I'm our water quality coordinator here. We serve 30,000 people just south of the city of Milwaukee, just north of the city of Gladstone. Uh, for water, drinking water, uh, sewer, and then our water quality for our stormwater runoff. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing just a little bit to open us on the companion planting for clean water with a connection between plants and the waterway or wildlife. Could do slide. So there's me and what I just talked about with the drinking water from the Clackamas River is where we get our 30,000 folks turning on the tap. We, we drink our lovely Clackamas River water basin. Then we have our stormwater in the middle and a nice little logo reminding people that all of our storm basins drain to our rivers. So keep your oil changed, keep your tires pumped up, keep your brakes in good order because all of our roadway runoff drains to our fish. And then the last part on there is our sewer treatment plant. We're just about to implement tertiary treatment, which will help with some of those smaller particles that right now go into the river. And um, we really appreciate our customers helping to raise the level of water quality with regards to our sewer effluent going into the rivers. Next slide, please. 
how do plants help water? This is something that um, we will hear from Lydia, I'm sure, as part of what she's talking about. Right now, we know that when we're in shady areas, our water is cooler. And what a lot of people don't know is that temperature is one of the biggest pollutants that we are facing challenges with in the Willamette and Clackamas River water basins. All over the country, as climate shifting happens, if we don't have shade over our water, that temperature is a big pollutant. Plants that are um, often natives will help sequester pollutants from our waterways, especially water plants like the one shown in this picture. This is a bulrush um, or a, a, a type of rush, I should say. It's probably not a bulrush. Lydia probably knows what it is. And um, a lot of plants that are in our waterways will sequester either in their roots or in the stem matters, some of those metals and other pollution that comes off of our waterways. And so with that, um, along with other benefits that plants provide, we help support the wildlife, including baby fish all over our basins. Slide, please. Watershed streams like deep roots. So I like this slide because it's a metaphor for how especially native plants provide those nice deep root masses to help water filter into our ground systems. Um, our watersheds, with the streams that are open and daylit really do help bring wildlife and plants all the way up into our neighborhoods. So this is just a picture of the North Clackamas Watersheds Council subbasins for our waterways. Oak Lodge is down towards the Willamette River, sort of the bottom left side of this picture. But all of our little creeks that are running through our backyards are opportunities for places for um, nurturing plants and wildlife in our own neighborhoods. Slide please. So plants filter pollutants from road runoff. I mentioned this earlier. Um, here's where I like to remember my some of my water plants with the sedges have edges but rushes are round. Grasses have nodes from their tips to the ground. So one of those nice little things that you can remember, uh, some ground level plants that can really help with creating places for water to infiltrate and filter into our rain gardens and areas around our houses that helps to keep the waterways clear and clean. Slide please. So in your backyard, a couple of things you can do to help support our water quality is to remove invasives and plant native plants and trees. These two pictures are the same area. So it's amazing to see how different something can look if it is supported by taking out that ivy and some of those other plants and then putting in complexity of native plants, high level, medium level, and low level ground covers, creates resilience. Natives are both flow of flooding and drought tolerant, and the shade can help slow the growth of weeds as well as keep our waterways cool and, and clear, like I talked about earlier. Slide, please. The root systems help with filtration and infiltration. So filtering those pollutants and also infiltrating the water deep into the ground to help restore water tables. Slide, please. And these individual actions, while it doesn't seem like much, um, I heard from Michelle at the beginning of this conversation that there were actually 3,000 people who have um, received information on these um, conversations. So every single one of you does make a difference in our waterway. Planting natives, creating rain gardens, using the shade to keep weeds down as well as that temperature lower, skipping your lawn chemicals, hand weeding instead of using uh, pesticides, herbicides, or insecticides, and then supporting wildlife with all of those individual actions. It does add up to water quality. What you do really does make yeah. a difference. Slide please. So there are a few resources to help make change. These are two little QR codes. Um, can you do the next slide? There we go. Native plants, rain gardens, and then tapping into follow the water and what's your lawn style. So in the slide packet that you receive, if you want to do these QR codes on your phone, follow the water is a regular twice a month. Um, text or Facebook posts that gives you information and links to videos about things that you can do 
in your yards um, and activities and places where you can connect to the rivers around you. It's a statewide effort to try to raise awareness and create behavior change for individuals making a difference. Um, and then what's your lawn style is one that's focused from fall of the water directly on pesticide reduction in the Columbia River Basin. So both the Clackamas and the Willamette Rivers drain into the Columbia River, and the EPA has a big investment in our region to help support salmon. And if we get those um, tire particles and road pollutants and pesticides out of our Columbia River Basin, we will directly be helping to support the salmon. So these are two that you can pull up on your phone, and they have lots of resources that you can link to and learn more. I please think that might be it. Oh, and then OSU Extension you can use as a big resource. A lot of those are posted there as well. So that's it for me. This is one of my favorite um, pictures that Neil Schulman from the North Clackamas Watersheds Council shared. It's what the Oak Lodge area used to look like with that large woody debris and multiple layers of complexity with native plants before humans moved in. Lots of beaver populations, um, macro invertebrates, and you can see our salmon down there in the river. So hopefully parts of our backyard will look like this again someday or have lots of other types of diversity um, brought in with the companion plants that Lydia is about to talk about today. With that, I'll turn it back over to either Alexis or to write to Lydia to take over. Thank you so much. If you have questions, you could reach out to me. Right, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lydia Cox. Um, and as Alexis mentioned, I'm a landscape designer and a garden coach. And I focus my efforts on backyard habitat and edible landscaping, and often blending the two together. Um, so I'm really excited today to share about companion planting. Um, I think in the last several years, there's been more actual research done on it, um, which I think is really valuable. And I think it's also important to look at uh, cultures who have really fostered relationships with plants and have built up um, kind of systems of companion planting that may not be, you know, as studied as they are today, um, but still work well. So I want to kind of dig through and, and really talk about the nitty gritty of what is companion planting, and then we can start talking about specific ways to utilize it in the landscape. So at, its, at, at, at kind of a basic level, it's really just growing different types of plants together in a close proximity to one another in order to gain a benefit. That could be a benefit to a specific crop that you're trying to grow. It can be a benefit to the area as a whole, um, but it's really just a combination of different plants together in a space for the greater good. Oh, there we go. Um, so some helpful terminology as we start talking about companion planting. A monoculture, is when you grow a single crop or a single plant species in a given space. This is generally what we see in really large scale agricultural situations or really heavily disturbed sites that are managed for uh, to uh, limit weeds and things like that, where they really just want to focus on one crop. And kind of the opposite of that would be a polyculture or interplanting is another term that's used um, pretty similarly to polyculture. So that's when you have multiple crops or multiple plant species growing, excuse me, growing in the same space at the same time. And I'll kind of jump back and forth with these terms. Polyculture tends to um, talk more about ecosystems and planting areas, whereas interplanting, you tend to hear that more when you're talking about companion planting in like an edible or a crop situation, but they really kind of uh, insinuate the same thing. And then another term that's become more and more popular is plant partners. And these are really just plants that either complement one another, meaning that one of them supports the other, or they um, do something that supports one another, or they fill complementary niches in the space that they're in. So they're not competing with each other, um, but they're, they're kind of supporting one another, or at least coexisting in a positive way. And I like to point out, we're kind of going big picture for a second, and then we'll drill down into more specifics. 
I think that companion planting at its best mimics natural layered ecosystems. So you're trying to increase biodiversity. Um, primarily, we're going to look at companion planting with plants, but that actually leads to increased biodiversity in insects and mammals and birds um, and really enhancing the ecosystem functions that your space is giving you. So whether that's a, a garden at home where you're growing food and you need a robust ecosystem of insects to keep your pest pressure in check, or whether those are ecosystem services like cleaning water and making sure that you have plants on site that are going to help slow and sink water down into the soil. All of those, in my opinion, can be accomplished with companion planting and really thinking through how you can increase the diversity of, of plants in your area. And Alexis, if you want to go ahead and do the poll, this would be a good time so I can get a sense um, these are all the things we're going to cover. So we've got a poll just to kind of assess for folks in the room um, what parts of companion planting really interest you or, or where you're coming from as far as your highest priorities um, in learning about companion planting. So you should see that pull up on your screen now. Um, we've got uh, managing pest insects, attracting predatory insects. Obviously, those are a bit related. Uh, reducing or eliminating pesticide use, attracting pollinators, increasing yields in the food garden, uh, creating habitat through companion planting, and protecting soil and water. We're going to touch on all of those in uh, this very brief amount of time we have. All right. And I can't actually see how many people have answered yet. So. Gotcha. So we're at just about 70% participation right now. And the answers are still coming through at a pretty good clip. So I think people are taking their time and deciding yeah. what all things to choose. <laughs> Like I said, I'm, we're going to we're going to touch on all of it to some extent and we're kind of scratching the surface, but I hope everyone can walk away with something. And I will mention now, since I have a moment while you're finishing up the poll, I have several slides in here that are lists of specific plants. And because we have such a tight timeline, I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on those slides, but I want you to be aware of them because when you get the slide deck um, emailed to you, you can then reference back to those lists. So I'll probably go a little fast. Don't feel if you can't like write down all of the plants that are listed, don't worry, you will have access to those lists. So I thought that's a good little disclaimer. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, we're not seeing too many more come through. So I'm going to give people the last five or 10 seconds. Three, two, <laughs> one. And there we go. And sharing the results. All right. Oh, it's all over the place. That's good. Yeah. Many interests. So a lot of folks want to know about attracting pollinators, um, creating habitat, of course, preserving soil and water resources. Okay. Good, good to know. Thank you. So we're going to start, again, helpful terminology, we're going to start with looking at pests and predators and pesticide use. And so the two um, terms that I want everyone to be familiar with, because I'll bring it up a couple times in the next few slides, are trap crops or a trap plant, which is a plant that is intentionally put in your garden or in your landscape because it's attractive to a particular pest. And it does a couple of things. It, number one, lets you really have a quick visual when those pests are arriving in in mass in your landscape because you know what plants to keep an eye on. It also gives you a chance to lure those pests away from a more desirable plant. So for example, a really common one and one you see in this picture is nasturtium. Nasturtium is a wonderful, it's actually edible. Both the leaves and flowers are edible. They have a nice peppery bite to them, but nasturtium is loved by aphids. And so some people would say, hey, I don't want to plant it in my garden. I don't want to attract aphids to my garden. But the reality is you're going to have aphids show up in your garden at some point. And if, especially if you're growing things that are also, if you're growing crops that are also attractive, like a lot of brassica crops, like broccoli and um, cauliflower and kale and those types of things, it actually behooves you to companion plant with nasturtium because it gives you a chance to know when those populations arrive because they'll, they'll, 
nine times out of 10 show up on your nasturtium at least several days, if not a week or so before they make any moves for your brassica plants. Um, so it's a visibility thing. So you know that you need to kind of jump into action. And just in general, you're always going to have more pest pressure on that nasturtium. So it really draws that population to what they like more. So that's an example of a trap crop or a trap plant. The other uh, companion plant that works well when you're thinking of pests and predators are what's called banker plants. And these are plants that are similar to a trap crop or a trap plant in that they are attractive to a certain pest that you are concerned about. But the idea is not that you kind of collect all those pests on that plant and then you rip it out of your garden. The idea is that you kind of let that banker plant exist and support pests so that you also have a food source for predators in an ongoing fashion. So a lot of people with their trap crops, once they get really pretty decimated by any type of, of um, insect, they might pull those out and start a fresh crop of nasturtium, for example. But a banker plant, you really actually wanna keep that around so that you have a constant food source that is not pests on your target crop or your target plant. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple slides, but I think it's a really important thing to think about when it comes to companion planting. So when we're looking at how we can use companion plants to minimize our pest pressure, the biggest thing is actually confusing them. Um, a lot of, of kind of the the thinking um, for a long time is that um, the most effective companion plants are repelling insects. And while that can be true, there are some plants that have uh, volatile organic compounds or odors that will kind of discourage certain pests. Um, it seems that more and more as we study it, what's often happening is that the uh, pests are getting confused or they're the more odorous plants that are being companion planted in with your crops are actually kind of masking the information that they need from the plant that they're hoping to find and that you're hoping they don't find. So this is an example with this photo, little blurry, apologies for that, but it really demonstrates well there's um, some cucumbers down kind of at the ground level rambling and then they have a bunch of dill and it looks like yarrow planted it around it. And the dill has a very strong um, odor to it, so it really kind of masks and physically creates a barrier for a lot of those pests that might be looking for the cucumber, in addition to providing a food source for predators, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, so that's what we're kind of realizing more and more is that it's not so much that you're repelling pests. Again, pests are going to show up in your landscape. A sterile landscape, a sterile garden is actually not the goal. But what we want to do is we want to minimize how much those pests affect our kind of our priority plants, our priority crops, and encourage their predators to come while they're kind of confused and not quite sure what to do. Um, so again, trap crops work well, banker crops work well, um, and just having varied heights, having things mixed together instead of having a big block of kale where, you know, once the, once the pests find it, once the aphids find it, they can just go crazy. Having that interspersed with things that physically break up all those kale plants is not only, in my opinion, more aesthetically pleasing in a garden, um, but it actually makes a real tangible difference because it's much harder for those pests to find what they're looking for. So kind of in tandem with that, you also want to be inviting predators um, into your garden and keeping them there. This is the key. This is where most people go wrong is that they think, OK, if I buy a bunch of ladybugs and release them, then I'm going to be set and all of my pest pressure is going to be gone. That's not usually the case. And I would also say as just a quick side note, um, when you purchase ladybugs right now, that's not regulated and they're usually being poached from the wild. So I never, never encourage buying ladybugs and releasing them. But the other reason that usually doesn't work is because you haven't necessarily built up enough habitat for those predators to stick around. So they're going to need some pest activity um, ongoing for their young to feed on. So that doesn't mean you let your whole kale crop go. It means maybe you have a couple of banker plants where you let them have aphids, you let the predators stick around and continue laying eggs, even, even when there's a smaller aphid population, you need some level of those pests to feed the predators and especially their young. Um, but it also means that you're providing a variety of food sources for the adults. A lot of adult predators um, are going to need nectar sources um, or carbohydrate sources, not just eating insects. So that's 
excuse me, why you want to plant um, a variety of different uh, flower uh, types and shapes and have an abundance of floral resources as well as part of that companion planting and interplanting. Um, and it's really important to really get to know those predator insects so that you can also make sure that you are not knee-jerk reacting and wiping out a predator that you've spent all of this energy trying to introduce into your garden or keep in your garden, because most of us are, are most familiar with their adult stage. It's really worthwhile to understand what the eggs, the larva, the pupa, and the adult version of any predator that you're trying to attract, understand what that life cycle is, and support each step of it. That's another reason why, you know, captured and released ladybugs often don't work because they're not getting all the support they need for their entire life cycle. Um, they were getting that kind of in the wild when they were doing their own thing, but then we introduced them into our landscape and we may not have everything there. So getting to know what they need to lay their eggs on, what their host uh, plants are, providing those um, is really key to keeping that balance between pests and predators. So here's an example, there'll be a handful of these in here. I'm just gonna kind of skip over it so you can review it um, later on. Um, but this is using herbs as companions because there are a lot of herbs that do both of the things I just mentioned. There are a lot of them that have strong uh, volatile organic chemicals that they put out that can kind of mask um, plants that press, pests might be looking for. Um, they tend to just be the ones that are easier to kind of incorporate and tuck in, plus you can harvest them. Um, and then there's a lot of plants, especially in the carrot family, um, the uh, umble family that are really beloved by a lot of predator insects. So having those so that they're supporting the adult life cycle of those insects is really important. Um, so the big thing with pesticides is this is where people get caught up because they may have a pest pressure that feels overwhelming or like they can't get on top of it and they reach for some sort of pesticide. Even if that's organic, that is still not safe for those beneficial predator insects or pollinators. And so what is better is to play the long game and say, if I'm having these increased pest pressures that feel overwhelming, not what can I do now to eliminate it immediately, but what can I do so that by the end of this season, I have everything in place that I have a resident group of these predator insects keeping my pest population in check. And by the way, birds are also a great predator for insects. So you're looking at, okay, if the pests are coming on hard and heavy early on in the spring and my predators aren't here yet to help keep them in check, or maybe I don't have a lot of nesting birds in my neighborhood yet, um, and building habitat for nesting birds is great because the young birds are mostly fed insects, if not entirely. Um, so if you're noticing that there's that balance is out of whack, instead of coming in and doing something heavy handed with a pesticide, again, even an organic pesticide, it's better to say what are the elements that are missing from my landscape or from my garden that are going to build up that natural balance in the ecosystem. And playing that long game and maybe saying like, hey, I'm going to come out and I'm going to spray off as many aphids as I can. I'm going to spray off as many white fly as I can. I'm going to physically remove as many caterpillars as I can. But the end goal is that I actually have built up enough companion plants in my space that are supporting my crops or supporting my desired plants and creating that balance in the ecosystem that is going to keep everything um, kind of within the bounds of not being too overwhelming, but also not being a sterile environment. You want to find that sweet spot in the middle. So a lot of people were asking about pollinators and how to attract them. Um, I think one thing that's good to, to kind of keep in mind is that bees are not the only pollinators. So the more diversity that you can put into your companion plants uh, to attract butterflies, hummingbirds, moths, um, the, the more uh, diverse pollinators you're going to have in your space. It is true that bees are generally the most effective, and that's because they generally have pollen collecting features. So they, even if they're going after nectar, they naturally pick up a lot of pollen that they can carry from flower to flower. Um, but these other pollinators are also really important and can be um, a nice, build in some nice resiliency for your, um, your garden and your crops. And so um, keeping in mind that pollinators come in different sizes. So uh, you do want to do multiples of different uh, multiples of single species so that 
you're not having like a single zinnia plant here and a single aster plant here. You want to have multiples because then you're going to have a nice big foraging area, but you also want diversity between those. So maybe you have a patch of, you know, three to five goldenrod on the edge of your, your edible garden area. And so a nice abundance of that goldenrod, not just a single plant is going to be available, but then you say, okay, that's one flower type. And that's kind of more of a midsummer to late summer bloomer, let's look at something that can be in the middle of, of summer that maybe has even a different flower type for other types of, of pollinators. So yarrow is one of the best, in my opinion, because um, it brings in a wide variety of sizes, aster, I have a list, so I won't go through too many more here, but just make sure that there's that diversity um, that you're working with. Because I think a lot of us get caught up in the, it has to be this plant and this plant paired. And that's not really true. Um, I have, I'm going to go back to that on the next slide because I have a little note, but just know that companion planting at its best is more about diversity and about supporting those ecosystem services. Um, so here's where we get a little more specific, and this is uh, tied largely to more of an edible landscape area. Um, these are some great plants to consider and kind of where you might place them. So herbs, I already mentioned, are a great one to interplant. So they're really nice when you actually put them in the bed, in the area where your edible crops are, and kind of mix them around because they're going to be really good at disrupting those pests from being able to find uh, that particular crop. Um, edible flowers are really great along the edges, and they don't have to be edible. Any type of, of flower that's going to allure um, pe uh, predators and pollinators are going to be great, but they're nice to do kind of around the edges. You can certainly intersperse them, but they're, they're probably, if you have a limited space like we all do, um, they're probably going to be most effective kind of around the edges because that'll bring the predators and pollinators closer to your garden. And then once they're in your garden, they can hop around to the herbs and things like that. Um, and then one that is also really helpful because this is going to grow how much you're actually harvesting. I mean, technically, all three of these categories are edible herbs, edible flowers and short season crops. Um, but short season crops work really well under taller, longer lived, long season crops. And I'll give you an example. Actually, I don't know if I have... Yeah, I don't have the example here, so I'll talk through the example while you're looking at this list. So an example of that would be, let's say you plant out your summer garden. It's June, July. You put your tomatoes in, your peppers, your egg eggplant. These plants are going to get a few feet tall or up to several feet tall for the tomatoes. And what can be really effective is to actually underplant them with things that are short season, meaning that you can kind of get a turnaround in a couple months or less, um, and things that can maybe handle actually being shaded out by those bigger plants. So radishes, leaf lettuces, salad turnips, carrots, uh, green onion, all of those are a really great option for something like an underplanted short season crop. Um, so again, here's a list. I just really want to focus for a second on the pollinator attractors and noticing that the reason I've listed these particular plants together is not because there's some sort of like magic between them. They're not the only plants that I'm recommending, but I wanted to call out that what can be really effective is look at what crops you are wanting to companion plant with and then look at which flowering plants are going to be blooming around the same time or ideally are going to start blooming a little bit earlier than that crop. And that's a really good framework to use rather than saying, well, I can only, you know, calendula near peas is the only option. That's not true, but that's a good highlight to say, well, calendula is something that can uh, bloom in cooler temperatures. Peas are something that go in early and they really prefer to grow and bloom and fruit in cooler temperatures. So that automatically makes them a pretty good companion to each other because the calendula will start blooming, attracting pollinators. And then by the time the peas start blooming a little bit after that, you've already got ideally some pollinators around. Um, and so that's what that particular snapshot, the takeaway I really want you to have is pay attention and match crops that bloom around the same time or just after um, a nice robust flowering plant. And that is going to be a good companion. 
And that's why I put, you know, for example, zinnia and summer squash. Zinnia don't start blooming until about mid-summer or so, but usually a lot of our summer squash doesn't either. And they're both very, very prolific, especially if you keep them harvested. Zinnias, cut them, take them inside. The more you cut them, the more they'll produce. And same with summer squash. The more that you take uh, fruits from them or harvest the flowers, um, then it's going to produce more and more. So they're a good companion because they not only bloom around the same time, but they also have very similar behavior behavior when you keep on top of the harvest. Okay, so we're kind of moving fast because again, we don't have a ton of time, but kind of scratching the surface on everything. This is a big way for you to keep that balance in your ecosystem. And it's to think about companion plants that are going to support year round habitat for your birds and your insects. And I do use beneficial insect pretty limited because I think all insects are actually important to protect and support. Even the pests have a role. They're often one of the, the lower parts of the um, food chain. And that's why we don't want like a sterile environment. So I'm really saying birds and insects. There's not, it doesn't behoove someone who wants to have a robust ecosystem in their garden to try to pick and choose and say, well, how do I create habitat for ground nesting bees, but not have habitat for some of the pests that might drop down and like cut, um, you know, cut worms and things like that, where it's like, well, you kind of, the best case scenario is you create habitat where they all can thrive and they keep each other in balance. And you're there to only step in when things get a little bit out of whack. You're not managing the system in a really heavy handed way. You're putting the pieces in place so that the system can kind of naturally run. And then you're there to kind of pinch hit and come in and say, okay, we don't have quite enough you know, predators right now, the aphids are getting out of control. Now I'm going to step in and maybe do a blast of water. Um, but it's really that long game. So if, if, you know, if you don't have that working year one, that's okay as long as you're moving toward creating habitat and selecting plants that you're going to um, combine in that, in that ecosystem that are going to serve these purposes. So when you're looking at habitat, those companion plants that are going to be most valuable are going to be things that have hollow or pithy stems. Um, that's where a lot of our um, cane or twig dwelling insects will need to overwinter. Um, we're looking at things that can maybe catch um, water so that there are water sources throughout. Uh, lupin, our native lupin is actually wonderful for this. It's beautiful and the leaves will catch water in the spring and even dew in the spring. Um, and that's really valuable as those insect populations start waking up in spring. Um, native bunching grasses make really great protection for a lot of insects and even just smaller um, mammals and reptiles. So again, we're really looking for that whole ecosystem, not just picking and choosing, because that's going to be a pretty um, useless plan if you're trying to pick and choose habitat. It just doesn't really work that way. Um, and things with multiple canopy layers. So if you're looking at, you know, if you're really allowing yourself to think about companion planting beyond just this annual flower in this crop, it's also saying, hey, do I have some areas where I have, you know, low shrubs, medium shrubs, maybe some, some trees even, and that'll encourage different types of birds to come because birds really like different layers in the garden. Um, so it's really going to help keep you on track throughout your entire landscape rather than just focusing on those short-term combinations. You really, you don't have to be a pro at all of those at once, but if you can kind of get comfortable with one and then say, great, I think I've kind of, I've kind of figured out which plants I like to pair together in my garden, my annual garden. Now let's step back and look at, are there some perennials I can add that are going to add layers or add habitat in different ways? And I've got two slides on natives. So again, I'm not going to focus on them now. You can refer to them later. Um, but this is a good chance for me to mention that there are a lot of native plant sales happening right now. There are especially a lot of bare root plants that are available, which is an excellent way to get cost effective native plants that you put directly in the ground as soon as you get them and they can set their roots and start waking up for spring. Um, and the soil and water conservation districts in each of our counties um, is a really great resource for that. So depending Depending on where you're logging in from, um, every county or even sometimes a county will have multiple soil and water conservation districts. And so if you look up your county, there's East Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District, there's West Multnomah, there's Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. It's really a good place to start if you are wanting to get your hands on some native plants right now. This is a great time to plant them. And even if they don't have their own plant sale or even if that has passed recently, 
Um, most of them generally will keep a database of where you can find native plants locally. Um, so I really recommend that as a resource. Um, but you can see just the thing I want to highlight before we do move on from this uh, particular slide, uh, caterpillar host plants are really valuable and it is one of the hardest things to adjust your mind to if you are thinking about companion planting to create habitat and support uh, insects throughout their entire life, life cycle is that your caterpillar host plants should have damage on their leaves. If you are saying I am, you know, planting anything from this list, especially something like milkweed or willow, and you're saying, oh gosh, but now I see damage, I, that, I, I don't want that, I got to pull it back out. That's actually what you're planting it for. You're planting it for caterpillars, larvae to live on it. And in a balanced ecosystem where you've got, you know, maybe you've got a lot of caterpillars, but then within the next few days, the birds realize that they start picking some off, the predators pick some off, and then you have a smaller population that's not going to decimate your plant and is going to be able to grow into the adult life cycle and keep that that system going, that's really what you want. So I think it's valuable to keep in mind the reason you're planting things and what that might mean for how they look. And really, if you have a balanced ecosystem, it shouldn't be decimated. It should be a nice balance where you say, oh, I've noticed that there's a bunch of leaves that have little circles taken out. I must have leaf cutter bees around. And that's great. And the plant, if it's a nice, healthy plant, should be well adapted to that. If it's a brand new plant, you might want to you know, be extra cautious that first year and kind of baby it a bit, really go out there and minimize pests, physically, you know, removing if there's too many. But a nice healthy plant that is well matched uh, with, you know, being a host of a particular insect is going to be able to be pretty resilient. Lydia, you've had such a great flow. I've been loath yeah. to interrupt you. Um, just coming in and let you know that we have just about an, a bit under five minutes left. Okay, perfect. I should be wrapping up in the next couple of minutes. So excellent. Um, okay, yeah, in fact, I think this might be my last couple of slides. Um, so water and soil. Um, so for water use, the really big thing that I think is the takeaway for um, companion planting is that the more, again, I keep going back to layers, the more that you can layer plants and you can cover soil with a living green mulch of plants, whether those are ground covers, bunching grasses. In this example, we've got two different types of low growing flowers. The bright yellow ones are gem, marigold. The white ones are sweet alyssum. This is one of my like dynamite combos. This is actually a photo from my garden. And um, I put them directly in my raised bed under and around things like broccoli and kale. And what it's doing is not only attracting those potentially beneficial insects, those predators, those pollinators, but it's also protecting the soil down at the base layer under those plants that are going to eventually get pretty tall, um, like a broccoli or kale, especially after you start harvesting, um, gets pretty tall. And it's going to protect that soil and it's going to allow wa my water use to be minimized. Because even though, yes, I'm putting more plants that are going to take up water in that soil, I also know that the net benefit of those plants shielding the soil from evaporation, slowing down water so it doesn't run off, um, and out-competing weeds that might take more water up, um, those are going to be way worth putting them there rather than leaving it bare um, because these also aren't really super water hungry plants anyway. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing for water use is really getting your soil covered so that your water stops, sinks, stays in the soil, and doesn't evaporate out. Um, and I will say, if you are going to be doing layers like this, uh, drip or oya irrigation works really well. Oya is when you have an unglazed uh, terracotta vessel and you sink it into the soil and you just fill it up every so often. And the capillary action in the soil when roots are trying to find water will pull the water out. It's an ancient system, um, really, really simple and easy to use. Those or drip systems work better than overhand watering. But if you need to overhand water, that's fine. I just wanted to mention that's a good strategy. So my last two slides are going to be on soil. And these have to do with making sure that you have roots in the soil, actively feeding that soil life um, as much as possible. And the reason that this is beneficial and the reason that I kind of lump it into companion planting is because, again, you're kind of creating those layers 
And then you're protecting the soil, uh, like I said, from evaporation and runoff, but you're also actively feeding the soil. When you can have a diversity of plant roots, so you have some plants that are rooting really deep. If you pull out like a tomato plant or a kale plant at the end of a long season, those roots are pretty massive. They can be like a couple inches thick and really go, um, you know, a couple feet down in my experience uh, into the soil. So pair those with shorter companion plants that are going to have those kind of fine inner roots that are up at the surface of the soil. And that's going to be a really nice way for you to be able to know that you are um, providing resources for that soil life at different levels and different types. Um, so again, kind of just scratching the surface. Um, last one I wanted to touch on is soil fertility. This is, you know, everything is interconnected that we've talked about. Um, but this is kind of one step to the side when we're talking about supporting soil life and keeping your soil in really good shape. Um, that is one thing. Soil fertility is where you can drill down and be a little more specific and say, hey, I want to actually inject a particular type of fertility. Maybe it's I want a boost of, of nitrogen. That's the easiest thing that you can get into your soil through a cover crop. That's where you can look at adding a legume Pretty much all legum leguminous plants uh, have a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that will take atmospheric nitrogen that's in the soil in little air pockets in the soil and convert it to nitrogen that plants can take up. So as a cover crop, if you're really wanting to increase that soil nitrogen before your new um, growing season begins, you're going to want to go with a legume. Um, but the other important part about doing cover crops, and you don't have to, it's just one strategy, um, but it can be beneficial because you can really pick and choose uh, which ones are going to be most beneficial for the needs of your specific soil. Um, and then the last piece of this for adding soil fertility and also feeding that soil is to um, chop and drop. And so again, this seems tangential to cover cropping, but the reason I really don't think it is, is because in order to have uh, an abundance of biomass or organic matter to add to your soil to chop and drop and leave as mulch, you're going to want plants that are kind of ready to be cut back at different times. So that's even another layer of companion planting is thinking about timing, not only when things bloom at similar times, but also, hey, if I know I'm going to want to have something that I can chop and drop and leave on the surface as a mulch right as we're getting into the hot season, then I'm going to plan for a companion that is maybe a, a cool cool season, here I'll go to the next slide so you can see this, a cool season cover crop that I know is not going to be happy in the summer, so I'm going to be fine just cutting it down in let's say June or early July, leaving it as kind of a surface mulch that will uh, protect the soil and eventually break down and just feed that soil. Um, I can be strategic in that way and vice versa. If I know I want something that's going to cover the soil as a living crop during the warmer season, I'd pick a warmer season cover crop, and then I would turn that in or I'd cut it and kill it back um, at the end of the growing season before we get into frosty weather. So that's a lot. I know I threw a ton at you, um, but we do have time for questions. And yeah, that's all I've got for today as far as the slides go. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that was a lot of great information. We've had a lot of great questions coming through. I'm just adding our spotlights back on. Um, Lara, I didn't see any um, kind of watershed specific types of, um, of, of <laughs> what's the word? This is me multitasking. I didn't have any watershed specific uh, questions, um, but I will let you know if anyone, if any come through, Lara. Um, yeah, Lydia, thank you so much. Okay, so... One of the questions that there was sort of a bit more dialogue on was about when and how and what as far as cutting back dead stems mm -hmm. um, kind of towards the end of winter. So um, there was a bit of discourse like avoiding pithy tall stems. Um, is it okay to stack, cut them and stack them in shallow piles? Only cutting stems that are dead or fallen over and broken with no seed heads. Can you talk a little bit more about what to do in regards to cutting back dead stems towards the end of winter time? Yeah, so and I will say I feel like I'm a continuous learner when it comes to um, really maintaining and being thoughtful with our, our landscape maintenance when it comes to habitat creation. I really try to kind of have my finger on the pulse. Um, but that said, I think honestly, the scientific field is really just starting to scratch the surface. So 
kind of the big picture thing to keep in mind is the closest you can do to either mimicking what would naturally be there or leaving what is naturally there is going to be best. So it's all a spectrum. So I would say at one end is not touching anything, letting it just be, you know, wild and natural. The other end would be, you know, raising everything down to the ground, which I do not recommend, um, but happens. So I think a sweet spot in the middle, if you say, you know, I really, for whatever reason, I really need to cut back, um, you know, some of my landscape, but I know there may be beneficial insects or any insect in there. Um, I would say if it is a hollow or a pithy stem, even if you're not sure if it's being used, but you feel for whatever reason you need to cut it back, best case scenario, so further to one side of the spectrum, would be to cut it. Um, and I've heard that you want to keep the same orientation that it had, because that is what the insects intended was to be if it's a vertical stem, they wanted to stay in a vertical stem, that's what they expect to be emerging from. So what you can do is do just like a gentle bundle, let's say you cut, um, you know, you cut a, a good, you know, foot or two foot of um, that stock down, you can bundle it and lean it up against a fence, a building, another plant that is maybe evergreen and sitting there and try to keep it in the same orientation. So that's one thing I've heard. Um, and then again, pithy and hollow stems are the highest priority. If it's something that clearly has just like no room in it, to be able to host anything, then I believe that's a lower priority. However, you don't necessarily wanna clean even those all the way off your site because they can be used for nesting. So I'm thinking about grasses in particular, sedges, a lot of our native um, either bunching grasses or, or sedges, those you might look at it and say, oh, it's kind of a mix of like, you know, old dry brown stuff and also kind of new fresher things. Um, you might want to just give it this season to sit tight and see how much of that brown actually gets cleaned out because a lot of times birds will come and that's exactly what they're looking for. They're going to kind of do some of that cleaning for you and take those older pieces that are easy for them to pull out and use for things like nesting. Um, so I think that is like the spectrum I think is good to keep in mind. So get as close as you can to how things are. Um, and then I think also just finding ways to keep those materials on site, but maybe you move them out of your main, you know, if, if you really like things looking tidy, maybe you move them away from that area, but you still keep, you have a spot where you can keep some of those, um, you know, grass trimmings and things like that, that are going to be valuable. Did that answer, answer it? Yes, that was really comprehensive. I think the only on the list of who, what, where, when, why was the when part. Um, oh, when, Yeah. So this is another thing I think for several years we've been saying wait until we have multiple days of 50 degrees and I think that there is some some you know real science to that a lot of insects needed above a certain temperature to emerge that said that doesn't mean all of your insects are going to be emerging once you hit that condition so the the Probably most important thing, honestly, the best way that you can be the best steward for your space is to observe and really pay, like it takes time and it takes effort. And that's where a lot of us run short because we just don't have a ton of time um, and ability to be in our gardens all the time. But if you can observe and kind of pay attention to saying, okay, we've had some nicer weather. I've noticed insects, but which ones are they? Am I noticing mason bees and bumblebees, but I'm not really seeing um, many other pollinators? Am I noticing that we're starting to have pests emerge, but I'm not seeing predators, that's a signal for you to say, okay, I might actually still want to be light-handed with my, with my pruning. Maybe that's when you say, I wait until after, you know, multiple days of 50 degrees to do anything. And then I start taking things away, but I orient them correctly and I put them aside and keep them on site. You know, it's, it's all kind of about like mitigating damage to that habitat, but in reality, we're all going to want to be in our gardens. We're going to want to do things. So I would say that the timing, that's kind of a good rule of thumb is to say, hey, we need multiple days above 50. That'll kind of trigger a lot of things. But honestly, I think the even better answer is uh, even at that point, observe pay attention to who's here and who's missing and still be pretty light handed and maybe do that for a couple seasons so you can really get a feel for what insects are emerging at what time for you. I think that's probably the best answer I can give that's kind of comprehensive, like detailed, but not so detailed that it's set in stone because that's just not how nature works. It's both succinct and comprehensive. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Um, And a, re a somewhat related question as far as moving dead vegetation but not wanting to disturb insects what about raking leaves um, yeah so this is a big one too and even I like five years ago or so I was like oh just shred all your leaves it's great for the soil and it's like well yes and 
you might be shredding a lot of your insects that are down in that soil. So I would say if you have at least some areas where you can just leave them, it's not a matter of when do I clean them up, you just let them sit there until they become soil, that's ideal. It does not have to be your entire landscape. I work with a lot of folks who say, you know, if I'm doing a design and they say, I really want to support habitat, but I, I also really have an aesthetic that I want for my landscape or my neighborhood requires it, or I just appreciate, you know, something about having areas that are tidier, then it's a perfect opportunity to identify and say, where can we fit in spaces that are truly undisturbed? And then we can have our spots that are like, we're free to kind of play around and uh, get in our garden and do things that may be more disturbing. And so I think it's okay. It's not all or nothing. It's not, you don't touch any leaf on your property or you left them all be where they're at. So I always say, you know, it's kind of a green light to rake or move leaves off of hardscaping, patios, decks, um, lawn, if you have it. Um, those are areas where, you know, if as long as you have some other areas in your landscape, just move the leaves to the other area. If you can, take them off site if you already have plenty where they're at. Um, but honestly, that is one of the most expensive things in landscaping, I think, is our habit that we've gotten, gotten into of removing all the organic debris and then bringing in mulches. That is never going to be as good for your soil. And it's it's honestly going to really increase your weeds when you do that, because a lot of these leaves also suppress weeds. I saw a lot of people at the beginning saying that their first thing to do is weeding. I have weeding, but I have like I've gotten to a point where I know where the patches of weeds are, but I've been putting down, I've been leaving leaves and putting down arborist chips and things where it's for a big kind of site that I have, it's pretty minimal. So I just really encourage folks to find the ways, even if it's small, just start small and say, hey, here's a patch that's kind of not, you know, it's not going to bug me. It's kind of off to the side or in the back. I can let things be, just let you know, let that area just be natural and then work from there and expand from there. Because you'll probably notice after a couple of years of having that little patch that you're, no you're noticing more things in your yard that you really enjoy, whether it's birds or butterflies or more pollinators. And once you start seeing that, I think it becomes easier to kind of change what looks pretty and what looks beneficial um, in your mind's eye. So. Hopefully it's not too preachy, but it's like, that's kind of, that's where you see more and more, the less you can disturb. So remove leaves where it makes sense, where they're not really doing a lot of benefit or the things that'll make it look really tidy without disturbing those kind of outer areas. That would be my, my advice. Thank you so much. Um, because we're getting really close to one, I'm just going to um, remind folks, actually, Lydia, you talked a little bit about mm -hmm. soil being so important. And next week we're hearing from a soil scientist um, about plants and fungal networks. And I'm putting that evaluation link in chat one more time for people. Um, uh, one question is what trap and banker plants are native? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I would say, oh, off the top of my head, it's funny because when you start thinking of trap crops and banker crops as beneficial as saying like, hey, I actually do want some things in my garden that pests are going to be attracted to so that those can serve the purpose of feeding my predators, feeding my birds. Um, it makes me start thinking, oh, okay, well, what are the what are the native plants I've seen that have had pest issues? Um, I, oh, I don't know off the top of my head. What I can do is put some thought into it and maybe send that, or I don't know how I could share it. Yeah. But I mean, anything that attracts and keeps the adult predators is good, but you really also want some of those banker plants to be things that you know, caterpillars like that, maybe aphids or other soft bodied creatures like. And at this point in the season, I'm just, you know, I'm thinking back to last year, I'm like, everything was perfect. Everything was wonderful. No, it wasn't. But I'm, I'm not thinking of specific plants right now that are native that have kind That's of passed. Yeah, I'll have to think about that one. That's okay. Um, So for everyone, the Michelle and Lydia and Lair and I will have an email chain with the communications person at the ELC. So um, I'll kind of share all those resources. We'll have the slide sent out and Lydia, that'll give you, that'll be the email chain for you to weigh in on that. That sounds um, great. And I did realize one thing, um, I didn't end with like a contact uh, sheet, but I do have on the slide deck on every slide, it says my website and you can um, contact me from there. So radishgardens.com. So if you have follow-up questions, feel free to reach out through the website. Awesome. Okay. A couple, maybe more specific, like Specific, maybe these are more rapid fire types of questions. Um, let's see, there's about four or five of them. So let's see if we can get through them in the next five minutes. Um, 
someone has dealt with the, what they thought were um, moths, but they're tiny on their, this is on their kale, tiny, about an eighth of an inch and in white. Sounds like maybe white flies. It's probably What's white fly. strategy for yeah. that. For Especially those. if you touch it and it becomes just like a cloud of tiny little white things. Um, they are a little bit trickier than aphids because aphids pretty much stay put and you can just blast them off with water from the hose. Um, I still primarily use hose or um, what I really like to do when it's like prime pest time, like in the next, you know, month, next kind of between now and mid to late April when the pests really start showing up is I'll actually just take a damp paper towel and I'll walk around my garden, especially if it's my veggie garden. And I will just look for leaves that have any type of pest and I won't necessarily eliminate them all because again, I understand that some need to be there to bring the predators in. Um, but I'll, that's a really good way because you can just, if I know there's white fly on a kale leaf, then I won't even turn it over because that'll make them all fly away. I will just like kind of wipe the leaf um, with the paper towel. But I, again, I try not to actually get rid of every pest because I know I'm not going to have predators. So that's that's probably my best way of dealing with white fly. But they're pretty tenacious because a few will fly away and then they'll come back. Um, but if you can kind of minimize them, get them to not be on every single leaf, they won't do a ton of damage if you have just a few leaves where they kind of keep showing up. That's what I do. Cool. Thank you. Okay, someone's peonies have been attacked every year by something where the edges of the, all of the leaves are kind of rick cracked and it doesn't produce any flowers. Any hunches on what that oh, one interesting. might be? Interesting. Um, I'm not sure because I've never had that issue with peonies. I've had some foliage damage before, and I do know that um, I believe earwigs will actually get into peonies and eat them. Um, but I, I just, I haven't experienced that yet. So I'm not sure what okay. pest that might be. Yeah. Maybe right. um, I would say go to a master gardener, like an extension service. And if you can especially provide photos, they might find out. Great idea. Yeah. The master gardener's resource is a great, great, great resource. Okay. Two kale questions and then a clover question. Um, for example, how closely do you plant nasturtium and kale together? I will underplant. I mean, I have underplant kale and nasturtium under kale before. Now that's usually when I'm using that trap crop as more of an indicator because they're so close together that I know that they're going to kind of hop right off the nasturtium. But um, I will often start with some nasturtium really close to it because then as soon as I see a big population on that nasturtium, I pull that whole plant out and I, you know, get rid of it. I compost it and then I'll usually start another round. And at that point, I might start them a little further away. So I'm still kind of planning on using nasturtium as a trap crop. But once I know that they're in the area, I can I can maybe move it to the edge of a bed or near a different crop that they don't like as much. Um, you don't have to do it that way, but that generally is how I do it. I just find that it works well. Um, but so I will- at the, oh, Go ahead. On the close end, is that like, are you saying like six inches, less than- Yeah, like, a, away? like a few inches, like just tuck some seeds awesome. in underneath. Uh, but like I said, you do still need to be there to pay attention to them. So if you are more of a hands-off gardener, or you're really busy during, um, you know, this kind of prime pest season, then I would say you do want to start them further away because you just, you don't want to miss that window when you can kind of address the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's the case, if you're a tax preparer, if you're like really busy right now, event season, um, then you might start it like a few feet away. Um, but the thing is you want it close enough that if the aphids do kind of show up on your kale, for example, first, that they realize pretty quickly, oh, there's something better over there. So you don't it's so far away that they're just in completely different areas so i'd say probably not more than four or five six feet you know maybe one end of a bed and your kale at the other and that's about the furthest i would do awesome thank you okay um someone asked like as a clarification are you saying that we should leave the kale and tomato roots at the end of the season is that a yes I do. No? I'm actually okay. really glad that somebody mentioned that. One of the absolute best ways you can feed your soil for free and for less effort is at the end of the season to actually just cut your plants just below um, soil level, take the tops off, go ahead and compost those, but leave the roots. Um, a lot of folks will say, but I thought I had to clean everything out for, you know, good garden hygiene. Um, but really, unless you have a diseased plant, that root system is just going to decompose. It's going to be eaten up by critters, broken okay. down by bacteria and fungi, and it's going to feed the soil. And you don't have to till anything in. It's already moved itself into the soil. And usually, if I do that at the end of a growing season, like when I'm starting to plant right now, I might have a few stalks that are still kind of like barely hanging on and, and have some, some some 
oomph to them, but for the most part, they've broken down most of the way. Um, so yeah, that's a huge one for me. And I do think that it's worthwhile, whether it's a big root system or a small one, just cut it at the soil surface, let those roots die back, and you will have like basically free, you know, free compost added directly to your soil. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I think everybody, everybody welcomes something that means less work too. <laughs> yes. That is the thing where we often are doing so much extra work and it's really, it's, it's because, you know, it's hard to focus on the long term, and it's hard to not want those immediate gains of like, Oh, I had all these aphids and now they're all gone. But really the goal should be that long term. I'm, I'm building layers. I'm, putting plants together that are going to foster a, a balanced ecosystem. And if you can do that, if you can really dedicate yourself and say the next, you know, two to three years, I'm going to pay attention and I'm going to, you know, put these plants together and not just have knee jerk reactions, but observe and say, oh, this, it was a little better this year. Maybe that's because I added these companions um, and just keep doing that. That's, that's where you get to those long-term folks who have a really nice garden that, like I said, you're not really micromanaging. You're just there to jump in if something gets out of whack, but it it, it becomes something that is a, a much more self-sustaining, um, which I think is the goal. I love being in my garden, but I don't want to do stuff all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. Well, we're at 106, so I could ask you one quick question and then wrap up. Yeah, okay. let's do one more and then we'll we'll be done. Perfect. Um, someone said with crimson clover also as a warm weather crop, when can the seeds be planted? Yes. Yeah. And crimson clover is on, well, it should be on both lists. It is both. Um, I, with most clovers, honestly, you can kind of put them in any time and they'll just sit there dormant and then they'll germinate because um because they are frost tolerant um you you can kind of do those anytime now i will say if you're doing them as a cover crop in like a raised bed or a dedicated annual veggie area and you're planning to start growing some spring crops it's kind of late for that um because by the time they get going you'll be ready to till them in and and start you know start your actual veggies um yeah. Yeah, so I'd say it's a little late if that's your purpose is to like have them as an overwintered cover crop. Um, if you were to wanting, if you were wanting to do that, then I would have probably started planting them back in like September or so, um, mm -hmm. and then let them just overwinter and then you know either kill them off or turn them in um, in like almost now or in the next month or so. Um, but as far as germination goes, so if you want to put them now so that you have a cover and you're not using that space until like a summer crop, you could do that now. They might not germinate immediately, but you could, you could sprinkle. I'm a big fan of planning to sow cover crops more than once. So you could sow some, let's say this weekend, and then you could sow some more either next weekend or the weekend after, kind of stagger those sowings. Um, but I don't think it's too cold for, for crimson clover. I think that most of the seeds are gonna just sit there and then they'll germinate as soon as it's warm enough. Yeah. Okay. Good well, question. Yeah, thank you so much. You're just a wealth of information and people have been really appreciative. So. Um, oh, we will let you go. I know you've got a jet and I'm sure others have things to get to as well. So once, once more for everybody in chat is today's evaluation link. And we just have a couple weeks left. Um, Plants and Fungal Networks next. And then we'll wrap up on March 7th with what tree should I plant? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia, um, for all that information. I'm going to have to see the recording to get the half, half of it. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> And cool. same Laura, I really appreciated yeah, the watershed health perspective. Um, so thanks everyone. And we'll hopefully see you next Thursday. 